How's it going? Uh, Caleb, thank you for joining. Yeah, so this is my first ever live stream here on YouTube. So uh, be gentle here with me here as I go through uh, and get stuff set up. So I've been playing a lot with this uh, new add-on called Scatter 5. It's one that's been released uh, fairly recently. They, they had like a couple versions of it before, um, which were awesome. I used it quite a bit in my workflow, but they just released uh, the newest version. I'll pull this over into my screen here so you can see it. Um, so this right here is the new version of Scatter 5. Um, really, really cool add-on, uh, integrates super well with the new version of Blender. Um, and so you got like a whole bunch of new features. And I was gonna kind of walk through like a couple of the new ones um, that are uh, released out here and kind of show you how I use it to design some of these floral scenes. Um, I have like a reference mood board here that I have from uh, Pure Ref, which I've started using a lot as per uh, really cool recommendation from someone on here as well. Um, to kind of organize my thoughts, organize my images, I start to use this a bit more. And now that I actually have a second monitor, this is kind of better suited for uh, live streaming as well. So I can actually like see, you know, what's going on here, see your comments coming in, respond to stuff as well uh, before I was operating on just one monitor. So the space is coming together. It's been nice to kind of set stuff up and, and get things going. Um, and so, yeah, I wanted to just kind of play around a bit with Scatter 5 and just show you some of the power of it uh, in the newest version of Blender. So I'm using Blender 3.0 right here. Um, so I just have a, a basic plan. I'm just gonna scale this up here, add some subdivisions as I usually do, just to give me some geometry to work with. Um, and right away, I'm just gonna use the Scatter 5 add-on here um, to uh, mark my plane as my target object. You can use this like little eyedropper tool to select it, same as before. Um, but what's different about this is it's now using a lot of the really cool uh, new geometry nodes uh, from Blender, um, the newest version of Blender to kind of scatter particles on your terrain here. So what I'd like to do is I actually have a whole bunch of biomes uh, loaded up here in the add-on. So if I just click on Scatter Biome, it brings up this really nice uh, asset browser here, which is similar to something you'd see in Cinema 4D, similar to what we had before in Scatter, but I think it's organized really nicely here with the different folders uh, for all the different types. If you want grass, if you want you know rocky kind of scenes, uh, wasteland, winter, and, and what's really cool is if you've never used Scatter before, these are kind of like little biomes. So uh, you don't really have to spend as much time with individual assets, kind of placing them in your scene. If you want to do that, uh, you can in fact do that as well. So let me just click out of this here for a second. And uh, if you go to Scatter Assets um, and you can like bring in your own assets and scatter them on there, or you know just use some of the assets from, from here as well. Uh, into your scene and just kind of go asset by asset. But it's kind of nice to start with like a, a cool uh, canvas, if you will. Uh, and some of these add-ons or some of these biomes are really fantastic. There's one uh, from another awesome creator uh, that I can pull up here in the Blender market as well. Um, where is this guy? Uh, let me pull this up in a second here. Uh, is it linked on this page? It is not. I will pull that up in a second here, but he's got really cool add-ons uh, in something called Gardener, which uh, is a really fun add-on with like kind of uh, topiaries, if you know what those are. They're those trees that are like super manicured in real life with like the, you know, the chainsaws and stuff. You're actually going up and kind of manicuring trees. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of these. You can see like a whole awesome library of these assets. So I've, I've yet to really explore too much with this one, I gotta be honest, but it seems like a really fun one. The one I've played around the most with and the one I'm gonna use uh, and kind of walk through here a bit with you is the grass blade one, uh, which comes prepackaged with a whole bunch of really fun floral uh, patterns, floral things. So if I just scroll through here, just to give you a flavor, just a little taste of what we got, you know, get anything from, from golf grass, grass that you'd see on a golf course, uh, to dead leaves and, and kind of dry scatter and stuff, things from meadows, uh, you got corn, cotton, lavender, even hay bales, which is kind of interesting. Like I've not used these yet. I'm not sure what uh, purpose I would necessarily have with these in a render, but uh, that exists as well. I mean, it's it's cool to have these options available for you to, to play around with and use. Um, so that's there as well. Some really beautiful poppy flowers and sunflowers and stuff that I use quite a bit for my renders as well now. Uh, before I had been using uh, a lot of the assets uh, from this right here, which is the Quixel Bridge. Um, they've got like a whole bunch of plants and stuff that I purchased here. Um, they have a pretty good collection here as well. But the issue with this is you have to bring them into Blender. You've got to export them out, which, you know, isn't that bad. But 
you know, it takes time. It slows you down as you're working through and it, it doesn't integrate as well into Blender. Um, I still do use these sometimes, but quite frankly, I feel like these are um, the way to go. This is much faster workflow. So for example, if I just want to use these flowers garden uh, 01 for my scene here, it's as simple as literally just clicking on add flowers uh, and it's going to import. This takes a second in the back end to kind of import your assets and just kind of keep an eye over right here on my windows where you can see stuff is importing into collections. And then you can also see it populating the systems list here uh, as well in the scatter add-on. So all of this is happening kind of behind the scenes here, but you can kind of visualize it as it's coming in here. And, and what's really nice about it is it organizes it super well for you. So this is something that you can do obviously on your own, you know, bring in each asset individually, placing that into your scene, but having this kind of already build it for you. And just like that, you already have, you know, a nice template to start off from. Um, and a little bit of behind the scenes, I guess, for my projects themselves, a lot of times when I'm kind of lost for inspiration or I really don't know how I want to begin a scene or how I want to populate a scene, what I'll literally do is just scatter particles randomly. You know, I'll pick one of these biomes, like for example, this one I just chose here, these flowers, scatter them on the scene and just go. And kind of from that, I'll get inspiration. You know, I'll kind of see like, oh, wow, there's, okay, maybe there's this interesting little path here that I could form and kind of, you know, carve out using some vertex painting to make that like a little walkway. Uh, I can maybe displace the train and, and kind of place my camera within here. So we're looking through the flower field or something. It's just a lot of fun to play around with this. And I think kind of having that base already to begin with really just takes you so, so much further, so much further along the process and having this already fully textured for you in, in really nice collection. So if I now open up the Scatter 5 collection, um, you can see there's a couple things here that are hidden. These are some of the proxy systems and different kind of backup things. The main thing that you're working off of here are these each individual objects here. Um, so you can see it's scattering kind of these different particles across your terrain. Uh, and one issue with it when you initially bring it in, you kind of have to do some tweaking is the randomness of this. So if you kind of look here, you can see stuff is uh, scattered in pretty well, but you want to kind of break it up a little bit scale wise, like everything's kind of uniform scale. Um, so there's a whole bunch of options here um, to actually adjust your distribution of your particles, uh, add in different masks. This is what I spend probably the most time with, honestly, doing the different masks for my terrain. Um, and then one I also spend a lot of time with is rotation as well as scaling. Um, so what's kind of nice is you can just adjust these different scaling and you can also choose different uh, masks here. So there's like a shrink mask, uh, a grow mask. So if you just want to kind of quickly, you know, add some scale to these or shrink them down a bit. So these ones are looking like a little bit small. Let's add them up a little bit bigger. That's like maybe a bit too much. This is just kind of the one to one multiplier. Now we're multiplying it by 1.2. So it kind of makes it like a little bit larger. Um, you know, you can just do like really fun things and just kind of scale them around differently, add some randomness, kind of break up your train a bit um, and have some fun. Uh, seeing some of your comments come in here. Caleb, dude, can't wait to see it. Uh, I have Scatter 5, but haven't explored it yet. Yeah, um, it's just, again, like I encourage a lot of people with these add-ons, just take the time to just kind of go through and play around. There's so many features. I'm still discovering things and, and kind of part of the reason why I wanted to do uh, a live stream as opposed to like, I guess, a more produced tutorial was just to show you the behind the scenes, just to show you, you know, my own process of kind of working through this and trying to understand uh, the add-on itself and, and work through uh, with some stuff that I honestly haven't really uh, done a lot before, which is the geometry nodes are a big one. Um, doing quite a bit of vertex painting and stuff is another big aspect of this add-on. Um, so we've got this scene here. Let's actually, you know, light it up here, right? Let me switch over to cycles here using my GPU. And I also like to have denoise enabled uh, in my viewport while I'm working, uh, just so I'm not fighting through so much noise uh, looking at my scene. Um, and for the viewport, I like to use optics because I've got the NVIDIA GPU set up here, which works really well with optics uh, to denoise things. And with that being said, I can switch over now to my viewport shading, which will take a second here to uh, process all the textures. There's quite a few textures from the different flowers and stuff. And now, just like that, you see we've got our scene. Um, it's looking pretty cool. You know, this is pretty nice. We got some interesting floral flowers here, but you'll notice it's very dark because we don't have any lights in our scene. I've deleted the default lamp. Um, so you could bring in an HDRI. I, I usually do that quite a bit. I'll bring in HDRIs to work through here and, and make my scenes. Uh, but there's another add-on I've talked about quite a bit in my tutorials here. Uh, and it's one that honestly I've been using, I feel like a lot more than HDRIs just because of the procedural nature of it, just because you're able to literally adjust every single parameter, even clouds and stuff. There's like a new clouds feature in it. Um, it's this awesome add on physical atmosphere. Um, and once again, it's as simple as literally just clicking a button here. And just like that, we've got 
this really cool atmosphere here uh, in our scene. And this is kind of basing it off of like a real uh, atmospheric parameters, like what atmospheric fall off actually looks like. So if you're looking at this horizon here, you see it kind of kind of fading away into the distance as if you're looking through, you know, thicker and thicker atmosphere off in the distance. You've got this really nice fall off. And if I look up high into the sky here, you'll see it gets darker and darker as you get higher up. And you've got, you know, stars even here that you can procedurally modify. Uh, it's just a lot of fun to play around with this one too. And I think it's, it's really quick to get some nice results um, in your renders here. So I'm actually just gonna uh, up the elevation of my sun here. You kind of pull the inverse direction actually to uh, have the sun rise up a bit more just so we have kind of like a brighter scene here. And I'm gonna turn off my uh, viewport display here just so you can see these assets up close. Let's just take a look at these and just see what we're working with here. Uh, Isa Marinda, hello, this kind of session is very helpful to learn more about Blender. Yeah, I'm glad you're liking this. Um, this is kind of something I've been wanting to do, honestly, for a very long time. Um, and I didn't really have the setup for it before. Uh, now I've got the second monitor. You're currently propped up on top of my second monitor where I'm able to see, um, see you, see your comments coming in here, as well as kind of get an idea for the, uh, the stream as well, and have secondary elements off the screen too. So I've got this like, little reference thing here that just pulled in off the screen. Um, but yeah, so look at this. I mean, just take a second here to just look at this. I mean, it looks really photorealistic, honestly. It's pretty incredible, some of these things. And just the light hitting off of the flowers uh, and different you know parts of this plants are looking super, super cool. I think it's, it's a really interesting setup. And just with a couple clicks, you've already got kind of a cool scene here that you can play around a lot more with uh, and, and make, make your own, you know, add in your own flair to it. And that is what I'm going to do right now. So I'm going to kind of customize this quite a bit here. Um, when I'm working with particles, kind of a tip here, especially if you're working on you know, a slower computer, uh, just turn things off in the viewport if you don't necessarily need all of them uh, running at the same time here. You know, Once you start adding a lot of particles, right now I don't have too many particles. Um, I don't think, I think my face is covering up a lot of the properties. Oh no, you can still see some stuff. Uh, at the bottom right of my Blender screen, you can see uh, you know, the, the number of faces, tries, uh, and the memory usage for my computer. I think the memory usage is covered up, but it's pretty low right now. Um, so I usually keep an eye on that while I'm working with particles, just because it's very quick uh, to you know, bog down your viewport and slow you down, especially when you're adding a lot of particles. I think what they did with Scatter is optimize it pretty well. And also, if stuff is really bogging down, you can also switch over. So say, for example, I've got this one right here. Uh, you can also do uh, different proxy systems uh, for these as well um, so that they're not actually uh, blocking down as much in your viewport. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, so I can just display these as like a placeholder object or like even like a bounding box or something like that uh, for now. You know, just you can choose like how you want this display. You can even kind of scale them down or scale them up. So this is a, a super low poly uh, representation of what this actually is. And if I kind of want to go back to the original, I can just unclick that and now we've got our full quality uh, mesh. This is just like a nice feature. I think it's super helpful to be able to have that when you're working in the viewport, just to know where the particles are going to be, uh, but not really slow your computer down as much while you're working. Um, Yugen Dami, thanks so much for joining. Watch your videos with NVIDIA Studio. Love your work. Thank you so much. Glad you like that. Uh, really fun tutorial series to put together. A lot of tips in there. I've got some more tutorial series in the works. Uh, a really, really big one. I will not uh, go into too many details about what that one is yet, but it's, it's going to be a fun one. Uh, really covering a lot of uh, stuff here uh, in Blender. Uh, so excited for that. Unseal Nadim, thanks so much for joining. Love your tutorials. Uh, big inspiration for my 3D work. That is awesome to hear. Uh, I always love seeing what you guys create as well. So um, if you ever you know, make something with my tutorials or inspired by my tutorials, uh, be sure to tag me you know, here on YouTube or on Instagram or wherever. Uh, I love seeing what you're putting together. Um, but yeah, so let me just uh, turn these particles off for a second here. And in this as well, what I liked before uh, about scatter was just being able to quickly add some procedural noise to your terrain so you know right now i've got a perfectly flat plane and if you're just joining and you missed this earlier i subdivided our plane added some geometry to work with here so we can actually kind of bend this up a bit uh and make it kind of interesting uh but what's really cool with this is if i scroll all the way down here in the uh extras tab here this might be kind of hidden here if you're initially opening it up in the extras tab there is this really interesting quick displace option here uh, so you can use like a UV, or what I like to do is just use these noise displacers. And the second one is the one I, I think I use the most here. Um, and this just kind of gives like a little bit of bumpiness to your terrain. Um, usually I want to scale up my noise just a little bit. We'll shade smooth on this as well. Um, maybe up the strength just a little bit. So we've got some 
interesting uh, little kind of bumps and stuff here now. So I, I always preach this in my tutorials, especially when you're trying to achieve photorealism, you know, having these imperfections is really important to do. Um, you're never really gonna see a perfectly flat surface in the wild. Um, so even just like a little bit of bumpiness like this will go a long way uh, uh, at making your renders look more photorealistic. And if this is all you do uh, to kind of achieve a little bit of photorealism with your terrain, you know, this is honestly going to be going a long way with this. Another thing is actually adding, you know, some kind of texture underneath here as well. Um, you may not even see it because it's going to be covered up by a lot of the plants and stuff, uh, but it's still going to cast some light, some light underneath uh, up at the plants above it. So we'll actually add some interesting shadows, some interesting luminance uh, behind our plants as well. So usually what I'll do for underneath is like either a mossy texture or some kind of like, you know, muddy texture, like mossy ground or something. I really like this Nordic Moss one uh, from over here as well. From This is a, a, a Quixel one. There are a whole bunch of free ones as well too. And, and if you've not seen um, some of my other tutorials where I go through just purely free assets, there's a great site I, I talk about a lot called cc0textures.com. Uh, they've got like a whole bunch of really awesome uh, textures free of charge for you as well there uh, that are super easy to bring over into Blender. But for this one, I'm just gonna be using um, the textures from Quixel Mixer. Um, and I had been using Cinema 4D quite a bit. I've been playing around with Redshift a lot more again. Uh, so I just wanna make sure I'm switching over to Blender for my export target and I hit export here and I'll bring this over into Blender. Uh, so I'm gonna go back into rendered mode here so you can see what this texture looks like and we can kind of mess around with the UVs a bit. Um, I'll open up my shader editor here and this is hidden initially here. So I'll just bring that up. Um, so what's nice about Quixel as well uh, is it, it brings in like a nice texture workflow already set up for you. So we've got like all of our stuff kind of already plugged in here. One issue I've noticed, and I'm not sure if you've noticed this as well, uh, if you're working with the newest version of Blender, uh, the team at Quixel have not yet developed a, uh, a working plugin for the latest version of Blender. So it brings in the textures all right. However, you'll notice that our grass looks incredibly shiny uh, because right now we actually have our normal map for whatever reason plugged into a mission. So I switched this over quickly just to normal here. And it's still shiny because for whatever reason, it has uh, a clear coat added to it. So I just usually put that to zero and our roughness for whatever reason is plugged into the specular channel. Uh, so you switch it back to roughness. And now we've got something that looks a bit, uh, you know, more like the grass that we had intended uh, to import originally from over here, uh, the moss rather. Uh, so that's just a, a little workaround for now. Hopefully they'll fix that. Hopefully they'll have like a new, um, you know, plugin working with Blender uh, again soon. Uh, but for now, this is what uh, we're working with and it's looking pretty good. So I'm going to start bringing back just a couple of these flowers uh, into our scene here. And I want to show you, uh, you know, how I use some vertex painting here to kind of mask stuff out and make a little pathway. Uh, so what I was noticing when I, I initially brought this in uh, was kind of like a little natural path right here. So I want to actually play around with that a bit more uh, and make that uh, a little walkway. So first, what I'm actually going to do is go over to the um, Object Data Properties tab. It's this little green triangle that you see here. Uh, this is a really powerful tab, by the way. I'm not sure how often people really mess around with this, but you know, adding in vertex colors, I talk about this quite a bit when you're mixing materials and stuff using vertex painting. It's super quick and super easy to do, and it's a really powerful thing you can do, a combination of this and your shader editor. And now we're going to do a combination of this and actually the scatter add-on itself uh, to do some vertex painting here. So I'm actually just gonna add in a new vertex color um, and I'm gonna name this just something default. So I'll just say this like it's our pathway mask or something like that here. So now that that's added in, um, if I go over to our vertex paint mode, you can see it is just a purely white thing here. And so we're actually gonna be like kind of painting on this, um, you know, by hitting control on my uh, keyboard and kind of painting along, I can add in like a little mask, if you will, to it. Right now this is affecting nothing but we want it to actually be affecting our system here, our particle systems. And so what I'm actually gonna do is go over to uh, culling masks and hit a new vertex color. And I can actually choose that pathway mask that I just created before. If you hadn't already created one, you can just hit this plus icon and it kind of creates one automatically for you. Um, right now, this is just affecting this uh, one system, I believe. Uh, yes, I think we're just affecting this one. Let me just turn off these for now. Um, Okay, wait, no, sorry, it's affecting this system, it appears. Um, so what I can do is, oh wait, is that right? Sorry. Oh no, sorry, it's affecting just this system right here, uh, this first one that is now invisible because everything is painted out. So what I can actually do is go over to vertex paint mode and paint things back in. This should, I think, work. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so we're painting stuff in. 
Uh, so this is the process of kind of painting in. And you'll notice it's not really painting everywhere where I'm kind of selecting things. It's just kind of putting a couple at a time here. And that's because our density is, is really, really low for this one in particular. Um, and so that is what we're, you know, having an issue with. But one thing I wanted to say is, you know, when I painted this in, I was hoping to kind of make a pathway, right? And right now we're actually painting these assets on what I wanted to be the pathway. So that's a problem, right? So here's the easy fix. So over in the calling mask, there's this little kind of like, um, you know, side by side arrow thing that just says reverse. Just click that and boom, it's now painting everywhere else. So now this is effectively acting as like a mask um and i'm kind of like painting this in here and now this is creating the pathway uh we can apply the same uh vertex color thing to our uh the rest of our objects here as well so if i add this in here vertex color and i can just choose that pathway mask again invert it as before and you can just add this batch add this i think to everything i'm not sure if you can select all this is a little bit tedious process there's probably an easier way if there is uh, and someone's messed around with this a bit more an easier way to do this uh selecting all let me know would love to know and i saw a message come in here sorry i didn't respond to this um could you uh save this live stream so we can watch this again later yeah sure thing uh as long as you're lenient on me if you're watching this uh, after the live stream and you're like wow this seems super unorganized um the whole point was to kind of make this kind of like a more behind the scenes approach uh and to show you my processes and working through this uh this add-on here uh just having some fun and just hanging out with you as well. I figured this was like kind of a different forum to chat with you all in here. Uh, I've done a couple Instagram lines and stuff as well, but this is like my first uh, YouTube uh, YouTube tutorial, if you will. Um, just kind of wanted to go through here and just have some fun. So yeah, I, I can definitely save this out for later. Um, yes, yeah, so Ronaldus Padigas, if you have to go to sleep, man, uh, this will be up for you tomorrow, hopefully. If I can figure out how to uh, save it out properly. This is again, this is my first live stream. So if I somehow delete this, uh, apologies, I'll make another tutorial as well, a more polished one uh, eventually. But just again, wanted to make like kind of a, uh, a just a fun one here, uh, just kind of going through exploring. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're kind of adding in this path here. I'm noticing one of these is not inverted or is not properly masked. There we go. Okay. So now we got like a little pathway, right? This is kind of cool. Um, let me add in the rest of my flowers as well. And just see what this this uh, this looks like this scene here, um, super super simple, and just like that, you know, with just a couple clicks here, we've got something interesting, right? We've got some flowers kind of on the side here, and as if, it's like as if you're walking along this little garden path here. Um, one hotkey I use quite a bit here is when I have my camera uh, added into my scene, um, you can just hit Control Alt and Zero um, to snap it to your current viewport. So if I like the angle I'm looking at. I'll just kind of quickly snap my camera to that viewport uh, and then change my resolution here to something more Instagram friendly, like this kind of vertical mode. Um, usually I would have my rendered view up in my second monitor, but you guys are currently up there taking up that space. How dare you? Um, no, um, I'm just going to use this right here. I'm just going to keep it in my viewport. Uh, it looks maybe a little bit cluttered, but you know, this is just the way I operate with this. I feel like it's, it gives me kind of the best approach, the best view of this stuff here. And so I'll just hit uh, rendered for this right one here. And then I'll, I'll have this left one here to be able to play around and do some stuff. Uh, I'm also going to crop this to render region and just turn off the display option for this as well here. Um, I want to have like a bit of a wider angle camera, I think, here. And let's just kind of make sure that our rotation is not kind of tilting weirdly. Um, kind of rotating this up a bit. Let me pull this down a bit. Kind of pull this a bit more into our grass here. And look at that. This is looking pretty nice. You know, we've got like a little garden pathway here. Um, so one of the inspirations for this little render here was uh, this image right here. It's like little one from Pure Ref. Uh, that I, or it's not from Pure Ref. It's, I think I found this on Instagram, actually. Um, but this is one that I kind of wanted to play around with a bit um, and kind of try to create with this. So like this little garden path. Um, we're going to try to make this a reality. So let's let's get it going. So we've kind of got an initial start here. Um, let me just switch this off here so I can just see through my camera angle. And I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of sculpting because I noticed I did add in, uh, you know, this little bit of displacement here from the Scatter 5 add-on. If you're just tuning in again and you missed this, hidden way down at the bottom here uh, is this little quick displace here. I did add in this little bit of displacement, right? And so now that's showing up over here. Uh, in our modifiers tab, you can see this displacement. 
Uh, I don't want it to be affecting everything. I, I kind of want it to make sure that it's not affecting this middle part here. And you know, one way I could do that is just brute force it, just go into sculpt mode and just kind of press down on this and flatten it down here. But I want to be like a bit more procedural with this so I can kind of go through and be a little bit more non-destructive and change this out later if I want. So I'm actually going to affect it by using a vertex group, another vertex group. Um, so I'm going to actually go down into here, create a new vertex group. And I'm going to call this my like pathway uh, mask option here. Uh, and let's go in to uh, use this, adjust this one here and make this one uh, our scene. Let's see here, void painting. Okay, so let's see here, this should do it. Uh, oh, there we go, that is not what I wanted. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna kind of like mask along here and let me go over and then make this my pathway mask and I wanna invert it so that we're just affecting this like kind of middle part here. Uh, so now what you're seeing is me actually just like flattening out this like little pathway here. Um, so just using some vertex painting. And again, this is non-destructive. So like if I did want to go back and actually have this be, you know, part of, um, you know, the pathway, I can just set my weight to zero and then boom, we've got a little bit of displacement here again. So this is like a, you know, a quick way to kind of do something like this. Um, so if you're like in a garden, right, you're, you're going to have kind of like a nicely manicured little pathway here. So I'm just going to kind of curve this around a little bit here. And maybe I, I go back into my vertex pane actually and kind of adjust this so it follows like a little bit more curvy type path. Uh, because if I look again at my reference, again, always go back to your references here as well. Uh, if you kind of get stuck in your scene, if you're kind of stuck with where to go, uh, I think it's always helpful to just go back and look at real life, you know, and kind of see how plants and things actually behave in, in the wild, right? Because that's what you're trying to mimic. Um, you know, that's the best thing, uh, you know, when you're trying to make something in, you know, CGI. Uh, it's a little bit tough because, you know, everything is perfect. Everything comes in perfectly smooth, perfectly rounded. Uh, you know, you got to add those imperfections in a little bit. So for here, this is a little bit of, you know, kind of perfecting the imperfections, if you will. It's a little bit of an inception. We're kind of taking a couple layers deep here and, and you know, making it as if a human was in our software here, kind of manicuring our, our terrain. Uh, a little bit funky, uh, but bear with me here as we kind of make this, you know, a little pathway a reality here. I'm gonna switch over to my vertex pane again here, and let's just kind of follow that path like a little bit more here. I'm just gonna kind of, you know, crop out some more of that stuff. And I've been going back and forth between Blender and Cinema 4D all day today, so I am kind of forgetting my hotkeys here. That is, okay, that is the one I wanna use. Yeah, so, and let me just kind of paint back in here a little bit on this pathway, and back again over here, because I kind of like that like little curve, almost like past the camera, if you will. Um, just to kind of make that like a little bit more of a, a natural curving pathway. Oops, I want to kind of erase this back here a bit more. Okay, so that is looking pretty nice. Oh, there's this one plant that's kind of being funky here for me. Let me see which one is this guy. If sometimes like, if you notice there's like, this is bothering me here, for whatever reason, there's this one plant that's kind of being scattered there awkwardly. I just sometimes just have to figure out which which one that is and just other oh, so it's this one right here if you're running into something like that uh just just change the randomized seed and see until you get one that's like out of the view of the camera so just clicking to the next seed uh get rid of that one for me i think this is the other one that i wanted to mess up yeah so just clicking that away it randomizes the seeds so now I'm, I'm not seeing that one anymore here as well so that's like a bit better setup as well um it's looking much nicer i'm gonna go back to my weight paint here as well and I'm going to kind of swing this pathway out like a bit more. So we've kind of have like a little bit more to work with here uh, for our scene. So that is looking pretty cool already here. I think we've got like kind of a nice little pathway going. Nice kind of smoothed out. And then this terrain is like much, you know, bumpier, much rockier, uh, whatever. So now we're going to actually try to add in those kind of bounding bars here. So you've kind of got this like little bit of a... Uh, I don't know, like a metal piece or something that's kind of been bent around as if it's kind of like wrapping around the plants and kind of forming this pathway. And then we're going to add in the gravel later. Um, actually, I'll probably do the gravel using this scatter add-on as well because they do actually have uh, some rocks in here. Oops, did not mean to click that. If I go to scatter biome, they do have like rocks in here, like kind of like a rock plane that you can use. I think they also have some in this gardener one as well here. Uh, way down at the bottom here, pebbles, there we go. So we're gonna scatter these pebbles actually along our pathway here later on. So that's gonna be kind of the final feature here to make a little garden pathway. Um, but you know, what I like to do usually when I'm making kind of, uh, you know, little garden pathways and stuff like this, uh, or, or bending kind of curves and stuff is actually use a NURBS curve as well, NURBS curve or NURBS surface. 
And, and what's really nice about these is if I go to my top down view here um, and kind of pull this guy up here, let me pull it up into my frame. So you see, I've got this like little NURBS curve here. And if I tab into edit mode, you'll see what it is. It's just, you know, four points influencing the curvature of this guy right here. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to kind of wrap this around here as if it's like forming this pathway, right? Kind of wrapping around like that metal piece here. Um, but what you'll notice is if I zoom in on this, it's, only this like little surface curve here, and it's not matching up fully uh, with the whole curvature of our, our scene here. And so if I go down to the object data properties for this NURB curve, you can go down to the active spline, and then you'll see there's like this endpoint option here uh, for U and V, it's just using the vectors here, U and V. If you hit that, uh, it's now snapping it to the endpoints of our NURB surface. So now, if I kind of click these around, it's actually modifying this whole curvature as well. And so what I'm going to do is just kind of smooth this out so as if it's like wrapping around. Let me actually enable this viewport uh, displays here so I can see where this is going. And what I'm going to do is basically just bend this to the pathway. Uh, and to create a new point, you just hit E to extrude as if you're just like extruding a face or extruding a vertice um, in your object and just kind of go around this. And what's really nice about this is it may not look like it because you're just seeing these kind of staccato points here. If I snap back out, you'll see how nice and smooth this is, right? So we've got a nice, smooth really nicely subdivided effectively, uh, you know, curve that we're following here. And it just wraps really nicely with our scene, looks really, really good. And so we can kind of use that to our advantage to make a really nice, realistic looking kind of curved path. And I do this all the time. I, I did this actually in a recent tutorial that I made uh, for YouTube. If you've not seen this one already, it's one where I make a, a fall scene uh, in Blender here as well. I used more so like the uh, Groswald add-on for that one to make some like leaves and stuff, fall leaves and stuff on our scene. Um, really fun one as well. And I, I use the same technique where I made these curves. Uh, and then actually uh, what the next step here is, uh, is actually making this into a, uh, an object itself. So right now this is a curve object. And so we're gonna actually wanna go into our object tab here. And then we're actually gonna go all the way down to convert and convert it from uh, this curve object to a mesh eventually. But before I do that, uh, what I always like to do is if you've spent a lot of time kind of making a spline and stuff, um, what happens with it is, uh, you know, if you make it into an object, it's destructive. You can't go back and, and convert it back to that curve before and keep tweaking it. Uh, so what I like to do is just shift D to duplicate this and kind of save this as a backup here. And I'll just kind of turn this off. Or what you can actually do is I, I sometimes make a new collection, just call this backups and then just mute this collection. And so that's in now in their backups kind of hidden from our, our view. Um, so now I can go here and convert it to a mesh. And if I needed to recover that from before, I can go back in and recover that pretty easily. Uh, so if I tab in edit mode, you'll see uh, it's now actually filled in a lot of that curvature, especially where it's like getting really curvy uh, with a lot more points. And what I'm just gonna do is select everything by hitting A and then just extruding it upwards um, by hitting G, Z and constraining that motion or that uh, extrusion to the Z axis. And you'll see it's a little bit choppy here. So what I can do is shade it smooth. And then if it's kind of still looking a little bit choppy, you can go down to uh, our normals and then auto smooth and you can adjust and play around with this angle here uh, to get that looking a little bit more smooth to your liking. So if I pull this down here, we've got like kind of an interesting looking pathway now, right? So this is looking kind of cool. I'll kind of put it a little bit more into the ground here. So it's kind of wrapping our terrain super well. And let's go over to rendered mode and just see kind of what this looks like here for a second. Now with our, our new tweaks kind of made to this, it'll take a second to process here. Uh, but in the background, let me look at and see what you're saying here. Um, let's see. Yo, Kurz, do thank you for the texture fix. Glad you're enjoying that. Uh, you can dummy, this is already looking amazing. Uh, glad you're liking how that looks. Sorry, this is taking a second here. There's quite a few shaders to compile since there are a lot of flowers and out and stuff here in the scene. Um, and for people who are joining elsewhere, let me do like a little bit of a, a shout out here for Instagram so we get some more uh, people coming through to check this out as well. Um, let me see what this link is here while this is loading up in my viewport. Sorry, this is taking a second here just to compile the shaders. Um, let me just share this link here. Uh, in the meantime as well, while this is compiling, uh, let me know what ideas you have for tutorials in the future too. I've got a whole bunch of stuff screen recorded. There's one uh, piece I made recently um, that I, I don't think I posted, or I posted a version of it. Let me pull this up on my uh, Instagram here. Um, there's like a really cool um, piece that I made uh, recently and I did kind of like a, uh, an underwater lagoon version of it. And I screen recorded the process of actually making like the whole scene minus, uh, minus the kind of um, 
what's it called? Oops. Uh, yeah, so like I, I screen recorded the process of making this scene right here. It's kind of like a desert 2.0 scene. Um, you know, that Sandy Room tutorial from before. Um, I made this scene here in uh, in Blender, minus kind of like the coral and stuff that you see here. So I'm, I'm in the process of editing that right now for a YouTube tutorial. Uh, so keep an eye out for that one as well. That should be a fun one to make uh, soon too. Um, but I somehow switch over to the materials mode. So let me switch back over to the render mode. And while that's going, I will uh, do like a, a cheeky little plug here for the folks over on Instagram to join me up on here. Um, yeah, so look at that. I mean, we've got a, a nice start already here. This is like a pretty cool scene that's like really, you know, kind of quickly come together. Uh, and just like that, it's it's looking pretty cool already. So what I'm gonna do is make a second one of these little things and then add in like a little bit of a pathway here. Uh, yes, so let me share this out. Okay, cool. Sorry for that brief interlude here. Um, so yeah, so this is looking pretty cool already, right? We've got like kind of a nice little curved path here. Um, oops, I'm kind of lagging out for a second. Okay, there we go, I'm back. Sorry, that was lagging for a second. Um, yeah, so we've already got kind of like a cool little scene here. Um, you know, this is uh, with just a couple clicks here with this guy, the surface. Um, so I'm gonna make a second one of these here using that same process as before and actually add that into the scene as well. So what I'm gonna do is uh, Shift A again, add in another NURBS curve. And so for this one, let me actually rename this as well too. I think it's helpful to rename your labor. So this is like the left uh, pathway border, right? And this is our, our right uh, pathway uh, border. And so for this one right here, uh, we're gonna actually do the same process as before, uh, where I'm actually gonna make sure that the endpoints are set to U and V. We're gonna move this over here, spin this guy around very quickly. And I'm gonna turn on the guys just so we see where we're working with here and kind of bend this around to our terrain quickly here. So this is another simple approach to kind of get this uh, together. And just kind of, again, following that same uh, technique as before, uh, just extruding along here, making like kind of a little bit of a curved terrain. Again, following the inspiration from this little bit of a, a render, or not render, this is actually a real place here. So we're trying to make that in 3D. Um, just really quickly doing that and kind of paging along here. Uh, that's looking pretty good to me. I'm gonna switch back to object mode and I'm gonna duplicate this one and then send the extra one to my backups tab here. Hide that from view, convert this one over to a mesh object. Um, so now we've got the same mesh as before. I'm gonna hit uh, A to select everything and just uh, extrude this up along the, the Z axis as before. Again, this is gonna come in looking a little bit choppy. So I'm just gonna shade that smooth uh, and turn on auto smoothing in my normals. Um, so there is our little pathway, right? Um, so what I'm noticing is there's like a little bit of leaking over with some of these assets here. So what I'm going to actually do is go over to that vertex paint again. Um, make sure I'm selected on whichever one this is here. Let's see. I'm not seeing what I want here. I'm not selected on the right one. Oops. Cause I'm selected currently vertex painting on this border. That's why I'm not seeing anything. So make sure if, if you kind of like snap off and you're not on the right one, make sure you're clicking on the right one. Let me label this as well too. So this is my ground plane. Uh, I'm like, where is this vertex color I made? Here it is. It's that pathway mask I made here. So now if I go over to uh, actually vertex paint, there is our mask as before. And I was noticing that this kind of one further along here is kind of leaking over a bit. So I'm just gonna kind of, you know, back that off. Just get a little bit off here. We'll do a little bit of landscaping, right? Just kind of trim that away. So now that we're not uh, influencing that as much. And for these ones, I want them to be hugging like a little bit closer. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of add that in a bit more. And so now we are having some really nice flowers kind of filling out our scene right there. You can kind of just paint these in quickly. And this is always so aesthetically pleasing to me. You know, I always love the process of just kind of painting in nature. It's kind of like a little Bob Ross thing right here. Like we're just adding in some tiny little tree friends, right? Tiny little flower friends into the scene. Uh, and just like that, it's it's really, really fun to do this with these add-ons. Um, and then if you accidentally add too much in, you can just really quickly kind of back it off a bit. Uh, super simple and just always a really fun fun process to do, I find, um, to add these these kind of little assets and stuff in. Um, so this is looking pretty cool already. Um, you know, now the last thing I wanted to do for this little scene here is actually two things I want to do. I want to actually texture these. Um, and actually, let's add a little bit of geometry to them as well, too, because what you'll notice is they're perfectly flat. And so uh, 
you know, in real life, you don't have things, even like super thin, thin things like paper and stuff, they still have like a little bit of depth, however small to them. So right now these are looking like sheets of paper. We want them to look a little bit more like kind of like corrugated metal. Uh, so if I zoom in on this, you see it's kind of like a little bit beveled almost here. Um, so I'm gonna try to kind of mimic that with these as well. What I'm gonna do is just add in a solidify modifier uh, just to kind of add in like a little bit of thickness to that. So you'll see, just kind of thickens it up just a little bit there for me. Um, and then I'll do the same for this one as well. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, I'm gonna add in a solidify for this one as well. And just like that, we just got like a little bit of extra thickness to it. Um, so that's super simple as well too. So now let's actually add in the pebbles uh, to this like little middle section here. Um, so to do that, I'm gonna just use, uh, once again, the scatter add-on. And I'm gonna go to scatter biome. And in the grass blade one, it comes prepackaged here with uh, a bunch of pebbles. I just showed you this a bit earlier, but there's some uh, really cool ones in here as well too. So I'm gonna try to use some with like a little bit of variation here. Uh, so let's see which ones would be good. Uh, let's try this like pebbles gray and black one here. So once again, if I just click that, it's gonna import it. Uh, keep an eye once again over on the right here uh, where you're gonna see like in the collections stuff kind of coming in as it loads in and just like that, it's already loaded in. I don't think you even got a chance to see that in the back end uh, because it loaded in so quickly. Uh, but now we've got all our pebbles added into the scene and you see it's added it in everywhere. And we kind of want it to be constrained to this middle section. Like you can see in a reference, they're just kind of, you know, thrown haphazardly along here in this middle section. Um, so we're gonna try to kind of constrain them to that middle part there. Uh, so I'm actually gonna make a, a new vertex uh, color. Or actually we can probably just duplicate effectively the same one here as well. But I'm just gonna make it, I'll just make a new one here as well too. I'll just call this like the uh, pebbles uh, mask as well. Um, so for this one, I'm going to add in a vertex paint as well, vertex color rather, and we'll make it our pebbles mask. And you'll see it's actually uh, effectively already using, I think it's actually using the mask, this other vertex paint from before. You can see this one right here. I actually want to, you know, be using the other one here. Uh, so let me just isolate that one for a second here. And I can just kind of paint in our pebbles into the scene just like that, kind of paint them in a bit more. So now that's kind of filling out this like little pathway here. Um, it's looking pretty cool. So we've got those like little pebbles there, but what I'm noticing is they're like a little bit dark for my taste, my personal taste here, honestly. So these ones are kind of like a little bit brownish almost, um, a little bit brown, I don't know, kind of reddish hue almost. These are like a little bit too dark and kind of almost look like asphalt in the scene. Um, so I'm actually gonna go try to locate these uh, particles where they are here. This is where they are, the pebbles. A pebbles gray here um, and let me see are they editable in here there's I think one way to edit them in is there a way to edit them in here there is not no so let me actually um, a, pop this open here it's gonna be this one right here so these are the particles I just have to kind of locate where these materials are they're like a little bit hidden at times um, but this is the, the pebbles that they're instancing. They're kind of hidden in this instance collection right here, this grass blade pebbles uh, down in the scattered instance uh, collection collection here. So we're many collections deep here as well. So just kind of keep track of where you are if you're working through here. Everything's really well labeled. And I think that's what's really great about this add-on too is that it, it does label things super well for you. It does a lot of the hard work of keeping the organizational structure intact for you, which is pretty awesome. Um, so for these ones, they come prepackaged with a really nice material here as well. And you can actually see all of these different properties that they've laid out super easily for you and, and just kind of adjusting these as well. So like if I want to add in some snow on top of these, just kind of dragging this a slider up here is affecting the snow cover on this as well. That looks a little bit out of place in our render here, um, but it is uh, super easy to kind of do that. And if I just tab into this, so if you've never seen these before in the shader editor, this is just kind of like a, a collection of shaders within it, kind of like a, a nested structure of these. If I go in here, you'll see there's a lot more kind of affecting this. And even within these, there's shaders within them, um, ultimately affecting this final material output here. Um, Mr. Gleesey thinks I'm wearing a bathrobe. I'm not wearing a bathrobe, actually. I'm wearing a, uh, a jean jacket, denim jacket. <laughs> We're, we're cozy here. It's a Friday night, right? Uh, we're kind of kicking back, just doing some fun render practice here. Um, so yeah, could be a, you know, kind of a chill evening. Um, but yeah, so for these, I kind of wanted to uh, change the color a little bit of them. And really the only properties I'm seeing here to be able to change are kind of like the dirtiness of them and, and kind of the, the dirt quantity and stuff like that. It's not really getting them to be lighter necessarily. 
So I'm actually going to tab into this here and see if I can find um, where there's like a base color uh, added into our principal VSDF. And this is where it's coming from. We've got like RGB curves here. And let's see if I can just kind of, you know, lighten this up a little bit more. And if that's not working, let's add in uh, a little bit more brightness potentially. See if that kind of works. I just kind of play around with this. It's, it's kind of like a, a journey of discovery as you're kind of like looking through and trying to figure out like which things are kind of connected to what, which things are influencing what in your scene. Um, and if that's not working, let me just like lower the contrast down a bit. Let's see. So that's kind of getting a bit closer to kind of the gravelly structure I wanted. And I can also add in like a hue saturation node in here. If I wanted to kind of, you know, just change the hue up a bit. Let's see if this can kind of fix it manually. It's a little bit hack approach maybe, but um, you know, sometimes it gets the job done. Or I can just unplug this completely. If this is not really working, um, I can just kind of do this manually, just unplug it and kind of fit it to where I want it to be. So I kind of wanted this to be like a bit of like a, an orangish brown kind of, kind of color like that. That's looking a little bit more like how I wanted it to be. Um, and yeah, these materials are actually coming directly from scatter. So once you add in, um, you know, all of your, your systems here. So like once you're putting things in into your systems, uh, it actually just comes prepackaged with all the materials and stuff. So it's really awesome, super easy to just kind of go through uh, and just make these super simple little scenes. Um, so that's always really fun to do. I think it's like a really nice quick process to kind of make those uh, into the scene. So that's looking pretty nice. And let's just check our reference again here. This is maybe like a little bit reddish. So let me just kind of pull this like a little bit more into the red area here. It's a lot of trial and error. I'll probably come back and revisit this again. Um, but that's already looking pretty nice. Um, so where there's areas that aren't completely filled in here, like if I zoom in here, this doesn't have like all of the flowers in there. I might want to add in some grass. I can kind of come to that a bit later, but let me just kind of adjust the lighting a bit more here. Um, so with my uh, add-on here, this physical starlight and atmosphere, you can adjust like really quickly a lot of the parameters of the atmosphere as well too. So I can just like increase the density and now we've kind of got like a more sunsetty, hazy kind of scene here. Uh, so if I, I kind of want to go for like an early morning uh, kind of scene, it's super simple to kind of do that. Um, and I, I kind of like the perspective in this scene where we're kind of almost like looking directly down at this path. So let me just kind of like pull my camera up a little bit more here uh, and kind of tilt this down a bit. So we're almost like kind of looking directly down onto this little scene here. And once again, control alt and zero uh, just snaps my viewport or my viewpoint rather to that perspective. Uh, it changed the placement a little bit here. So let me just uh, make sure that we're including everything in here that I want. And just like that, we're kind of getting a nice little scene scatter too. It's looking pretty cool. Uh, let's try to fill in, like remedy this little situation here. Maybe it's a matter of just increasing the density a bit of these particles. So to, to increase the density, uh, you can go, where is it? Down to here in the distribution tab. This is kind of a little bit cut off here, but it says distribution is the very first one you'll encounter here with scatter. Um, and it has a option particles per meter squared of your scene. Uh, so this is just kind of basing it on your terrain. And if you just kind of pull this up a bit more, you'll see it's, it's scattering uh, more and more particles. But what we're noticing is the bounding box of this is kind of impeding a little bit into uh, our pathway again. So if that's the case, I just kind of switch back over to the vertex paint and just kind of paint away uh, wherever that is kind of competing from. So let me just see where that is, in fact, coming from. Sometimes you just need to kind of kick it back a bit. Oops, I'm drawing on the wrong one. Let me draw on this pathways mask. There we go. I kind of beat this back a bit. Nice, okay. Yes, so let me actually change the distribution seed. That's looking pretty good to me. I kind of like this one almost because it's it's kind of obscuring slightly our path, but we see like the path kind of coming through still and kind of keep playing around with the seed a bit more uh, to get it to something where I, I really like how it's looking. So that's looking pretty good. Again, a lot of trial and error here. That might be the one. Getting a little bit of competition with it. That is That might be the one right there. Um, again, it's still kind of slipping in a little bit over here. So I kind of want to get rid of that somehow. Um, let me click on this one here and make sure that we're on our right vertex color group. And I'm just going to kind of paint this away. That should be working. And that is 
ignoring our vertex color group actually. Oops, I'm drawing on the wrong one, that's why. Let me click on our ground plane and our flowers, vertex color, and our pathway mask. Okay, cool. Nice, so that's the one I wanted now. And I can kind of just paint this away. It should be working. Okay. Yeah, so that's like a bit better. I think that's kind of closer to where I wanted it to be. Um, but yeah, so this is like, I mean, just with a couple clicks, you're already getting kind of like a nice scene here. And this is kind of mainly what I wanted to demo is just the quick quickness of this add-on in making scenes that look really nice and realistic. Um, you know, you could just add in a little bit more to this. Uh, I probably would like texture this up a bit more with some kind of like clay materials and stuff uh, to make that a reality. Uh, make it look a little bit more like our reference here as well too. But just like that already, very quickly, it's looking really nice. Um, we've got a really cool scene kind of coming together. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that this is what's so fun about this add-on and just how powerful it is to really quickly add in different things to your scene. Um, and if you don't, you know, have all of these different assets, so like, for example, I, I have, you know, a lot of these things from Grassblade um, and Gardener, um, you know, just the Scatter Pro comes prepackaged like a whole bunch of really great things already to use. Um, if you don't already have these and you want to use like other assets and stuff, so say, for example, I wanted to tap into some of the assets and stuff I've got over here in Megascans uh, here as well. All you can do is just import them in. And so say, like, I'm just going to use like a little mesh here. Let me just have this cube here. Uh, say I just wanted to scatter this cube along my scene. Uh, what happens with scatter is they have like a whole bunch of scatter presets available for you. So if I click over here, uh, it loads up just a bunch of these different, you know, scatter options that you can have. And if I just kind of mouse over them, it, it gives you like a little bit of a description for what they are uh, typically. Um, so like if I just click on this one, for example, this is the 12 pattern. Uh, you know, if I click on this one, 15 pattern, it's, these are just like the different ones. It kind of tells you the distribution and stuff as well. So if I just click on that and then scatter asset, um, oops, no asset found in asset browser. Oh wait, I'm not scattering on this. This should be doing it. Selected objects. There we go. That should do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you actually have to pen that over to selected objects as opposed to selected assets. Um, so now we're scattering this like little cube uh, way too many times over our scene. But if I like turn the density down here, um, you'll see we're scattering this cube along our scene. Uh, so that's it's pretty you know nifty as well too if you wanted to kind of add in your own assets and stuff to this as well and scatter things. This is also helpful if you're even doing stuff that's not nature related. So if you're adding like greebles and stuff to your scene, right? So if you're making like a spacecraft or something, you want to add a whole bunch of like antenna and stuff to it to make it look like a you know like a Millennium Falcon type thing or, or a Star Destroyer. You can just select like your little greebles, your little kind of wind digs and things and, and scatter that this way across your scene and then kind of influence the different scattering uh, using vertex painting again or, you know, just changing the scaling and stuff the random is. It's super quick and, and fun to do that as well. Um, so that's one option as well to do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is pretty much the scene. Uh, there's a, a couple other add-ons that are in the same family as the scatter add-ons. So B production, um, let me pull this up as well. B Production is the person who developed uh, some of these other add-ons for this as well. So if I search over here, uh, let me see. Yes, here we go. Yeah, so B Production uh, does some awesome work as well too. So uh, in addition to making this grass blade and gardener, which I have, like I said, integrated in uh, into Blender, there's also this vegetation one here as well too, which is similar to kind of like a botanic, botan IQ type of add-on. It comes with like a lot of really great uh, tree and plant assets. Um, I use this one quite a bit as well too. I've been kind of exploring around with it a bit more. If you've seen some of these lily pads in my scenes recently, um, I've been sourcing them from here as well too. Um, they've got some really great add-ons as well here, or some great assets rather as well here. So to kind of finish out like a garden scene like this, I would typically kind of look through here and see if there's stuff in here that I can kind of bring into uh, my scene a bit more as well. So if we're, we're looking at a garden inspiration here as well, like what else do we see in gardens? If I kind of zoom in here a bit, we've got like some, maybe some shrubs and bushes and stuff in the distance. So I can, I can search for like tree hedges and see if there's anything there or like shrubs here. Uh, so say for example, I just like pull from one of these bushes here. Uh, I can just add this tree into my scene Take a second here to process and now i can kind of rotate this around and scale it up in my scene here and it even comes with some animation presets as well so if you're really going crazy and you're making like a an animation with these 
uh, you can add in like some kind of procedural wind to it as well, which is kind of nifty too. So if you're ever doing that as well, I think that's kind of fun. Um, Ducks, shout out from Brazil. Uh, great channel, bro. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Um, yeah, so you can add that in. And what's also cool about this too is it randomizes uh, when you add in a new one. So if I add in another one of these, it kind of like randomizes it as well. So it's like a different, um, you know, different asset, different kind of scaling, different rotation as before. Uh, so I can kind of add in a little bit of randomness to my scene, if you will. Um, so there we go, just like that. Um, Mr. Gleesey, seeing these add-ons makes me want to dive into realistic scenes, but I don't know. Hey, it's fun. I mean, I personally enjoy doing it quite a bit. It's just like very cathartic, uh, especially when, you know, the world is kind of in chaos right now. Uh, it's nice to kind of build out these things and make like utopias, if you will, uh, in, in 3D here. I think it's always a fun process to kind of, you know, design reality and kind of make stuff uh, that I would want to see in real life, you know, in these, in these places. Um, so... That's kind of a lot of what I do for these series here is just kind of making, uh, you know, like kind of dreamy places uh, that you could escape off to. Um, so, yeah, this is looking kind of cool. Let's just fill this out a bit more. I'm going to maybe add in some kind of trees in the distance here to kind of block off the field of view. So we're not, uh, you know, seeing into the distance where there's like a massive hole in my render where this is just jumping off into the abyss. If you kind of follow this pathway, we're going to fall off uh, the edge of the earth. Um, so let's not do that. Let's just kind of fill out our scene here. Um, yes. So there we go. I'm just going to add in this tree here as well. I don't want to be casting too much of a heart shadow. Maybe you kind of drop that in there. It's looking nice. This is why I hate redshift. It's so hard to use. Cycles is too cool. Cycles is super cool. Uh, I gotta be honest. I'm a little bit biased because I do really like redshift as well. Um, I was actually using it a bit earlier today before jumping on this live stream. Um, it's a really fun piece of software, super powerful. Um, but yeah, at the same token, it is a little bit confusing to use just because there are so many things to tweak and so many things to kind of play around with. Um, let me actually just fire up Redshift here just to show you what this looks like as well. Um, just to kind of compare it with cycles. And I just don't want to overload my GPU here while I'm streaming and rendering things. So I'm going to try to keep this in without kind of lagging too much for you. Um, do you know for which programs it's available? Yeah, so Redshift, I think, actually is soon to be uh, compatible with uh, with Blender. I think I, if, if there might be some kind of plugin and stuff already with it. Um, but for example, so here's a scene. I, I posted this over on, on Instagram actually uh, yesterday or two days ago. It's a scene with like some clouds and stuff in it. And people always ask how I make my clouds in Blender. Um, I actually don't do clouds in Blender. Personally, I don't really like the volumetrics in Blender as much. Um, I think they kind of work a bit better over in Cinema 4D. Uh, with Redshift, personally, just the, the volume uh, data properties are so much better uh, over in Redshift. Um, so if I open up here, you've got like a volume material uh, that you can add in here. And these are, I think, a lot more customizable, personally, I found in, uh, in Redshift compared to Blender. So if I just open this up, it is a super simple looking material. It's kind of similar to what you see, like a principled volume plug into an output node. It's what they call like a, an RS volume or redshift volume. Um, but what really I think sets it apart from Blender is the uh, customizability over here in the node property with the scatter coefficient, absorption coefficient, and then taking it a step further, the actual shadow density. Um, and then even further than that too, uh, what's really cool about redshift uh, when you're adding in lights and stuff. So for example, for this scene, the way I lit it was pretty simply, I just had a couple area lights. Um, so if I kind of go out of my camera here, um, so if I go out of here, you'll see there's just a couple area lights. There's one coming in from this side window here, one coming in from this back window here. And then I've got a, what they call a dome light in Redshift. It's effectively just an HDRI. Um, so I've got like an HDRI image plugged into here, uh, lighting the scene overall. But to actually light volumes, sorry, this is a really tangential from the original discussion of Scatter here, but I think it's cool to just kind of talk about 3D software in general. Um, so what you're actually able to do here in Redshift, which is pretty crazy, is if I go into each of these lights, you'll notice there's a whole bunch of settings. Um, so if I tab back over to Blender and just click on the light here, so our, our starlight sun, these are the only settings that you can customize in Blender. Um, there are some node properties, custom properties. I know some people uh, do a lot of really cool stuff with the shader in here. So you probably can do this, but it, it's, it requires a lot more work kind of on your end, kind of setting up the UI effectively to do this. But in cinema, what you're going to be able to do here is uh, adjust actually, in addition to like the intensity and exposure of your light, the kind of the tinting of it uh, is also how this light is affecting your volume. 
right? So if I click over here, there's this volume uh, property right here. And what I can actually do is adjust what's called the contribution scale. And this effectively is going from zero to one, you know, one being like 100% effective uh, usage on this, um, on the volumes rather. Uh, and then you can also taking it even a step further, which is just how powerful Redshift is, is adjusting per light the sample contribution uh, for just volumetrics here. So you can see I'm, I'm designating 256 samples for my render uh, from this light affecting volumes in my scene. So this is just how overwhelming it is for Redshift for a beginner user coming from Blender looking over here. There are just so many things you can control, but if you know how to actually start to control these and, and do them properly, um, it, it really, it's super powerful, but it is just so many different tabs and stuff to dig into. And Glissy's making a great point here that scatter and similar add-ons uh, are, are more intuitive uh, uh, to kind of set these things up here. Uh, but Redshift is just like, it's so much more powerful. And then if, again, if I'm taking this a step further, if I click on this edit render settings here and going into Redshift, um, you have all of what's called these sample sampling overrides. Um, so if I go into here, you can actually just, uh, you know, override the designated whatever default samples that uh, Redshift is just going to throw at your render uh, for specific properties. So for reflection, refraction, uh, AO, passes, light, volume, uh, so usually what I'll do is I'll, I'll override my light, my volume ones and really crank these up. I'll give it like 1024 samples or 1024 for volume. Uh, sometimes I'll even put a little bit more. This obviously slows your render down, but it gives you uh, crisper renders and, and Redshift in, in, in general is, is a really fast render engine. Um, it's, I think, one of the fastest ones, I think as well. I'm not sure what the stats are on it, but comparing it to like Octane and stuff, Redshift is like a powerhouse because of its GPU rendering capability. Let's take a drink of water here. Um, yeah, so in addition to this, sorry, again, this is kind of tangential here, but let me just like pull up uh, these materials as well too. It's kind of insane with the materials is you can also uh, go into the material editor here. So I'm just gonna click on my RS material for the sand that I used for this render. You can actually like per property, uh, you know, impact the uh, render samples as well too. So for example, if there's like uh, refraction transmission, uh, of the sand, which there's not, uh, you know, I'm, I have a weight of zero for this. So this is maybe a bad example. Let me go over to my glass here that I use for the windows. Um, so if I go over to the RS material here and I've got like a, a glass material added in here, I can override the refraction samples here and, and add more samples in, uh, in Redshift here. So it's actually using a little bit more sampling uh, for this as well. So this is, you know, super, super nitty gritty down to like literally the pixel scale. It's a little bit feels like pixel pushing at times with Redshift, just with how like you know, detailed every single thing is with it and how meticulous you really have to be. Uh, but if you're able to optimize these and kind of choose where to selectively throw samples at your render, you know, at specific materials that are maybe causing your, your render issue with noise or specific lights that are maybe adding a little bit too many fireflies and stuff to your scene, uh, it can really speed up your renders. Uh, it can really give you really clean photorealistic results. And like I said, all of the cloud renders and stuff that you see, uh, spoiler alert, those are all made, at least right now, in Redshift. I, I really don't like how Blender deals with volumes just yet. So I've been mainly doing a lot of those over here in Redshift and some of the other renders as well. Um, someone says, there goes my Blender career. Um, yeah, we have entered the, the gates of hell as soon as you open the render settings to get me started on subsurface scattering. Yeah, yeah, oh my gosh. If you're making like jade materials or kind of, you know, little skin or something like that, you know, skin obviously has subsurface scattering. It gets kind of crazy uh, as well too with some of these things, but it's super powerful again, super powerful. And in addition to that too, if I, uh, this kind of got shuffled over the side here, if I pull this over here um, in your renders actually as well, this is kind of equivalent to the Blender compositor. You've got a lot of really powerful settings here too. So almost as if you're editing in Photoshop, you can like add in LUTs to your scene. You can do like color correction and levels and stuff in here. And I really like the bloom and streak controls here. So usually with my renders, I'll, I'll throw, uh, a bit of these, uh, like the post-processing effects in here too. And you can kind of see these in real time, which is really nice uh, when you're rendering. Uh, I don't have anything chugging here right now, but so that is a, a, a broad strokes overview of, of Redshift. I'm not sure how we got on the topic of this in the first place. I think someone mentioned using Redshift, um, but yeah, this is uh, this is chaos usually. So I, I would not recommend Cinema 4D for beginners. It's, it's a very uh, complicated, specifically Redshift. Cinema 4D, I think in general is pretty easy compared to Blender, like for motion graphics and stuff. But when you're getting into like Redshift and, and render engines like that, uh, it's a lot more complex very quickly. So um, I'd recommend getting some more experience first with something like Blender or just like vanilla Cinema 4D before you kind of dive into those.
Um, but yeah, so back to Blender here. Uh, this looks much more friendly to us, right? Uh, our render settings and stuff are super easy and stuff to dial in here. Um, what I, I've been using a lot more recently for my render settings in Blender, and I encourage a lot of people to do these as well, um, is using denoising. Um, I, I had some issues before with denoising kind of smoothing out my scene a bit too much, but Blender's added in optics denoising, which I think really works well in the viewport. And then when you're actually doing final rendering, uh, their open image denoising, I think works fantastically um, to kind of make some really nice, uh, you know, crisper renders. It kind of gets a, a rid of some of the noise. Um, and then when I usually, when I go into Photoshop, I'll kind of bring back a little bit of kind of this filmic noise as well. A couple questions I missed as well. Uh, can you show a comparison of volumes in Blender versus Cinema 4D? Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, Blender is, it's kind of a struggle bus a bit. I did actually make a tutorial recently um, with volumes in Blender and actually converting like your logo into a volume in Blender. Um, I'm not gonna go into details of that here because I, I made a whole tutorial about it, but um, it does take a lot more tweaking, I feel like, to get a good result. Um, that's not like, I don't know, looking semi-transparent or too dense. It's kind of hard to find like the nice in-between of like a very cloud-like model. Um, and someone actually asked about Houdini as well here too, like what my opinion is on Houdini. Swan uh, Juan asked me this. Um, I do use Houdini a little bit as well. Um, you can actually make some really cool volumes in there, like smoke volumes and clouds and stuff, and then bring those in as uh, VDBs uh, into either Blender or Cinema 4D. Um, so that's the process for making clouds. I actually don't make clouds in Blender itself. Usually you source them from outside uh, programs. Um, so that's what I do as well. Um, Nimble Duck is asking, what are the main add-ons you use for floral scenes? Uh, so for this one, I've been breaking down the one primary one I use, which is the scatter add-on here. Um, so this is one that they just made like a new version of recently, Scatter 5. Uh, where you can scatter like all kinds of really cool biomes and stuff. So I was just kind of, if you're just tuning in, which some people seem to be just tuning in here, um, you might have missed this initially. I used uh, quite a bit of these assets uh, from in here to kind of fill out the scene. And now I can click this over to render it again here. Um, but I use this to kind of fill out my scene and make some flowers here. So I use that one primarily. Um, there are also some really nice uh, assets from other add-ons too. For this, I was primarily focusing on just using uh, scatter, but Polygon IQ, uh, they have an add-on called Botan IQ, which is nice as well. Um, the process is like a little bit different for this one usually. I won't go into details on this one on this video here, just for clarity. And to try to stay on topic, I know I'm kind of going all over the place here, but it's fun again to talk about the 3D stuff. Uh, but this one, they've got a couple flower models as well here. So if I go to flowers, um, you can see there's a whole bunch of these different flowers as well. Um, not as rich a collection, I feel like, as the scatter one, but still quite a few cool ones too. And usually what I'll do is um, I'll make these editable, bring them in and uh, scatter them across my scene as well. Uh, it just takes a little bit longer, but yeah. Um, so that is pretty much scatter five as well. Um, how do you use Quixel Megascan assets in Blender 3.0? Oh yeah, so I covered this as well. Uh, initially, you might've missed this as well. So usually Quixel integrates super well with Blender. Uh, I'm sure you've dealt with this before where you just click on an add-on, uh, make sure that your export settings are set to Blender and then you just hit export and, and it pipes it over into your Blender uh, window. Um, but what you're gonna notice is when you do that uh, initially, it's gonna kind of plug in all your textures uh, really weirdly into your scene. Uh, so let me just demo this again with uh, this like cube over here, for example. Um, so let me just import a texture into my scene. Oh yeah, if you just joined, yeah, no worries. Um, I'll just go through this quickly again. It's a super simple uh, little fix. So, uh, let me do one where it's really noticeable. Let me import this rocky uh, soil ground texture into Blender. Um, so, okay, yeah. So if I go over to this cube here, uh, this is the rocky soil. I'll add it in here. It's the same process as always to add this in, but, um, okay, it's actually hard to see on the cube. Let me just add in a plane here so you can actually see this a bit better. Um, let me pull this over here. Scale this up a lot so you can really see this, uh, exactly what's going wrong here. Uh, rocky soil. So it's looking like really shiny and really weird, right? Um, because they haven't finished making the uh, new uh, export add-on for Blender. Uh, and so what's happening is it is still importing all your textures into Blender. You're still getting like all of your different maps and stuff, your, your diffuse, your roughness and normal and everything, uh, but they're plugged in wrong. Uh, so you have to do like a little bit of uh, adjusting on your end, your end here and kind of take note of where stuff is going wrong. It might be different for you. This is at least where it plugs it in for me when it imports. 
Uh, it plugs my normal map for whatever reason into the emission strength. So I just pull that down here to normal. The clear coat roughness is for whatever reason turned up. So I just turn that off. Um, whatever reason, the, the roughness is getting plugged into the specular. So I just kind of change that channel uh, down to there. And that should just about fix it. Yes, I think that fixed it. Um, yeah, so that so that fixes it. So for whatever reason, it kind of glitches out that way. I'm not sure why. Uh, but now we've got, got it properly in there as well too. Um, and that's looking more normal. Um, obviously it's not display, so you're gonna wanna add displacement and stuff to this, but um, yeah, so that's like the weird the weird fix, uh, weird texture fix. Um, normal into emission strength is hilarious. Yeah, that is kind of weird if you think about it. So if what is a normal map, this is a normal map, right? Plugging that into an emission, you get some like very, very bizarre results. Um, so this is uh, this is normal. So this is what it should look like now, right? Um, so that is that is the little fix for that. So yeah, sorry, if you just joined, um, that was the, the little technique for kind of fixing that up. Um, yeah, I think I missed a couple of things. Yeah, um, yeah, so that is pretty much all I think I wanted to cover with Scatter 5. I, I wanted to make like a more uh, kind of detailed tutorial, uh, you know, showing you actually how to design a scene with this. From I mean, I, I did show you how to design a scene here as well, kind of like make this little forest path here uh, or garden path here. But I think doing like a little bit more comprehensive and step-by-step and -step one as well without as much stream of consciousness, I thought it'd be helpful too to do like a live stream and kind of talk through uh, and explain kind of behind the scenes as well uh, for this process, just because, you know, you often don't get to see this process, right? You often don't get to see, uh, you know, kind of the workflow, kind of me struggling with things and, and figuring things out. And I think um, there is some value in seeing that, you know, there is some value in seeing uh, live stream, seeing the behind the scenes, um, especially for new artists. And I think, you know, speaking as someone who was at one point a new artist myself, uh, it is very overwhelming uh, to log into, you know, ArtStation or Instagram or even YouTube and you see super polished results from people, right? You see work that people put out that is super high quality because you want to share your best work, right? Um, so you'll see stuff like on ArtStation or on Instagram that is like super high resolution, super high quality. And you often will feel very intimidated as a new artist looking at that and, you know, it obviously was not something that was made instantaneously. It took a lot of people a lot of time to get to that position and, and kind of make art that looks cool, that's shareable. Um, and so I think it's helpful to kind of show the, the process, show the behind the scenes and, and make these things a reality. Um, so kind of breaking these things down and showing you the struggle, showing you the behind the scenes, the workflow to get to these uh, works is always fun. Um, and I'll definitely consider doing these more in the future. If you have like an idea um, for another one of these live streams, a specific thing you want me to cover um, in kind of a smaller format. Obviously, I don't want to be on here for like three hours going through. Um, if you've got a nice idea, feel free to like leave a leave a comment on this video. If you're watching it later, if you're watching this after the stream, um, be sure to leave a comment as well. And I'll, I'll try to like parse through that and see um, what kind of people are gravitating towards uh, to make that into a tutorial. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about as well is, is how I designed my apartment space here. Uh, actually in 3D as well. So I actually took the floor plan of my apartment uh, and made it in Blender. <laughs> and uh, it was like a whole process as well, which is like really, really fun to do. Um, so I kind of want to talk about how to do uh, more physical real world tutorials in addition to some of the stuff that you see here, uh, obviously digital work uh, on Blender, uh, which is cool too. You know, it's, it's always helpful to, to show you the digital side, but I think like, if people are interested in kind of more of these real world things as well too, um, I think that could be cool to cover as well. Um, another thing I've been doing that is also real world with some application to Blender is uh, photo scanning actually, right? So uh, I just recently got a, a new phone, um, an iPhone 13 Pro, and it has um, a really great integration with this app called Polycam um, with LiDAR. So it has LiDAR built into the phone uh, so what you're able to actually do is go in and, and 3D scan objects really easily or use your phone to, to 3D scan things as well, which is really awesome. Uh, and what that's allowed me to do is uh, make some really cool assets and and uh, bring those into Blender. Uh, so let me actually like import one of these into, uh, into my render here. Oh, and another thing too, this is a, kind of like a, a side thing as well that I'll, I'll kind of cover a bit more detail. Let me see if I can open this up here. Um, oops, that lag for a second. Um, 
Now that kind of crashed. Uh, but yeah, I've been scanning uh, ocean foam as well, so sea foam. Uh, at your level one of the DSLR be better. Yeah, it's for, for convenience though, right? So what's nice about Polycam is that you take the pictures and it automatically uploads them to the site from your phone. Uh, you could do DSLR and I, I usually use, um, I think you can see it. Uh, no, it's not in my uh, um, shared little icons here, but I use uh, Meshroom quite a bit to make 3D assets as well. So I have a Sony uh, A7R three uh, camera, a mirrorless camera that I'll use to take a lot of uh, photo scans outside. Um, and then bring those in to Blender as well. But yeah, for Polycam, the sake of convenience, and iPhone has an incredible camera too, a little plug for iPhone, I guess, and I don't think they really need it, but um, they obviously have some really great uh, cameras as well too. So what's nice with that is you can just take pictures and, and have it automatically, um, my scans. <laughs> uh, where did it go? Yeah. This is pretty cool. This is really exciting. This is what's like so fun about this. And I feel like a little kid again, uh, going out and scanning these things and bringing them in uh, into Blender. Uh, so this, if I zoom in really closely here, is a little tree branch that I scanned on the beach uh, in Blender. And so I'm in the process right now of actually cleaning some of these up and making them like really nice uh, and retexturing them a bit. So you'll see there's like some kind of texturing going on in here. Um, but I'm trying to kind of crisp these up a bit more and make them look even better. But this already like looks really, really, really cool, right? You got this dead tree branch. And what's really cool about this one too, let me show you this. This is kind of like a funny detail that I didn't even notice I got until later. I think it's in this one. Uh, where is it? I somehow randomly got like a, a baseball scan in this one. Yeah, there it is. Um, this is so funny. So I, somehow I managed to like scan a baseball that was like sitting on the beach as well. Um, yeah, usually, yeah, there's someone mentioned that there's usually a lot of artifacting for the tree. So actually, I didn't use LiDAR for this one. I actually just did photo scanning and took, I think, like a couple hundred pictures of this, got really close in here uh, to the little branches and stuff themselves. Um, like even these like little tiny little twigs and stuff sticking off here uh, and scanned this up super, super close. Uh, and so that was really fun. So I did a whole bunch of these scans um, when I was at the beach a couple weeks ago. And so now I'm in the process of, of kind of cleaning these up and I'm going to release these uh, to everyone over on Patreon to use as well. And also make a tutorial uh, showing how I use these to make a, a scene as well. Because I do actually try to use some of these things and integrate them into uh, stuff that I post up on, on my Instagram or elsewhere uh, too. Um, but yeah, th so this is like a, a thing for another day too. I think this is something I want to cover a bit more as well. But if that's of interest to people um, making these kind of things in, in, in real life, I did actually a tutorial recently where I made um, a render using a photo scan I took in Georgetown, actually. Uh, if you remember that one, this is also on my YouTube page as well. If you've not seen this one too, it's it's a fun one. Um, yeah, no, so someone asked, uh, is, yeah, is, uh, Galicia is asking this one, all, all your phone or with your cam? This is all with my cell phone, which is, I think, insane to think about, really. Like, it's just the power of being able to record something with your cell phone and then upload this online and have something this crisp. It's pretty nuts. Like I don't really, you know, I just kind of have to take a step back and think about like how far technology is literally is common. Like just the past couple of years alone with something like this to be able to, to make a scan with your cell phone. Um, it's pretty nuts. So yeah, so this is all with my phone making this everything you're seeing right now, um, entirely from the phone, including like adding in some of the textures and stuff here, uh, from the scan itself. Um, now what I do in Blender is typically um, kind of pull these back. I'll usually remesh these a bit uh, using a, a decimate modifier, uh, just because these kind of come in like a little bit dense, a little bit hot. Um, and so like, I'll usually like to bring the poly count down just a little bit so they're not like bogging down my scenes. Um, and then I'll also kind of cut off the fat too here, right? So if I look at the edges here, um, we've got like a lot of detail in the middle. Let me actually uh, tab into edit mode so you can actually see what this looks like. Um, so it's a pretty dense mesh, right? Uh, but you'll notice that there's a lot less density at the kind of fringes here where I didn't get as many pictures at those edges, obviously, because I was kind of focusing on the subject in the middle. Uh, so what I would typically do here is just kind of trim the fat. I would just like select these points over here and then just delete them. Um, you can use like edge loops and, and the knife tool and stuff as, as your friend here. So using K on your keyboard and kind of like selecting points this way, whatever, um, is like one way to quickly kind of, you know, cut these out too. So uh, that's like one thing you can kind of do as well. Uh, to kind of cut things out and make make little points, little cuts and stuff as well. Um, yeah, I think that someone just said, I think that double the whole scene's polys. I think it did as well. Um, so obviously not very optimized here. So the whole point for me now is to try to optimize these a bit so I'm not killing your viewport when you actually do use these, hopefully, uh, for your own renders. Um, 
let me just delete that and see what that does. Yeah, that actually I think did in fact double the the scene. Oops. Um, but yeah, so look at this. I mean, this is fun. Um, back to you know, back to this initial thing here. We kind of got like a little Naboo scene here, right? We got like a little floral oasis uh, with our scatter five add on. So really fun. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I just I guess I wanted to go through and, and just kind of show uh, some of these things here. Nimble Duck, so much for me to learn in Blender. I know it can be overwhelming at times, but I think that's almost like more exciting, if you will, because there are so many different things that you can learn, so many different avenues of, of research, of, of personal development, personal growth with the software. There's so many cool things to lear learn. Um, and I think that's always the mindset to have with 3D is to you know never stop learning stuff, never stop being inspired by other people uh, and seeing what people are doing with the software. And I, I hope that I'm able to kind of show you like a little preview of what I'm doing personally, just to see if you can like pick up any tips from my workflow um, and kind of learn from my mistakes here. Uh, and then just kind of see things that you really like to do. Um, yeah, the devs are faster developing than us learning. It's kind of insane how quickly the software is developed and how many new tools uh, and add-ons and stuff and, and capabilities there are with Blender, uh, you know, just in a couple of days alone, it's pretty insane. So yeah, so definitely uh, just keep learning, keep you know pushing yourself to do new things and, and share your work out there whenever you can, whenever you've got stuff to share. Um, I think it's always helpful to get feedback on your work as well too. Um, yeah, but I think I'm gonna have to sign off now. Um, I will try to make like a more polished tutorial uh, over the next couple days from some of the stuff I've recorded. Um, and I'll try to figure out how to make this one live as well too. But I wanna thank all of you for tuning into this one. This is my very first ever blender live stream on youtube uh thank you for participation for your questions and stuff it's been awesome to kind of chat with you on here in a different forum than i would usually uh so hopefully this is enjoyable i see people really reacted well to this so definitely consider doing these in the future as well too um so thank you for tuning in and i'll see you on the next one